Hello, Carrie again with another episode of Garden Side Chats. We are here today at the Veterans Urban Farm talking about some fruit trees that you can add to your front or backyard um, as kind of landscaping trees that also provide fruit. So the first one we're going to talk about is our mulberry tree that's at the north end of our Veterans Urban Farm. It's a beautiful tree that also provides ample amounts of shade. It's one of the very few shady spots that we have. Right now, we're kind of at the very end of mulberry season. If you're not familiar with what mulberries are, here's a white mulberry. And they kind of go from greenish white to pink to, this is a ripening one, to fully like purple. And mulberries can vary widely in uh, flavor. They can, at the worst, be just like flavorless little berries. Or the best, they can be like kind of sweet and tart and just like really wonderful that one was good um, so mulberries as you can see can become like a shade tree in your yard now this tree is decades old so it's definitely taken some time to get here but the good thing about mulberries is that they're really easy to grow and pretty quick growing uh, relative relative to other trees um, some downsides of having mulberries in your yard are uh, they just rain mulberries. So you can see we put these benches under the mulberry tree because it's one of the few shady spots and it's just dropping mulberries right and left right now. So I wouldn't put any like lawn furniture under the tree in May or June. Um, now mulberries, while they're also good food for humans and a nice sweet snack, um, birds love them. You can't really see, but there's a whole assortment of birds kind of flying in and out of the branches eating the ripe berries. Um, but they also, as they drop, they also attract flies and other insects too as they kind of like drop on the ground. So just know that as your mulberry tree gets bigger and bigger, that's going to be like more of a reality. But even with those uh, cons, we love our mulberry tree here. Um, mulberries are normally not, this type of mulberry is not normally planted. It's very easy it's, to grow. It's kind of considered a weed tree because birds eat the berries and poop the berries out and then mulberries will grow in fence, fence lines and that kind of thing. But I think it's, you know, one of those easy trees to grow that does provide some fruit and is a wonderful addition to a big backyard if you have one. So. Next to the mulberries, we have a much smaller tree. This is an Asian plum. I do not know the very specific variety. It makes beautiful golden plums. You can maybe kind of see some ripening fruit up in those branches. This tree is about 10 years old and is maybe 15 feet tall. And it's going to kind of max out at that height. It's, it's a dwarf tree. So a standard, what they call standard, and um, a plum tree can get taller, but this is about as tall as it gets. And it has this spreading, as you might like kind of go around the, the base here, it has this kind of spreading vase-like branching structure, which is kind of nice. It's kind of similar to like, maybe kind of like a dogwood or a redbud. So it's a really lovely tree, beautiful white flowers in the springtime. Unlike the mulberry, which doesn't really have like like they do have flowers obviously but not of any like note for attractive qualities but this plum has stunning white flowers and it'll just like totally take over the whole tree similar to the mulberry tree uh, if you don't pick the fruit the fruit will fall on the ground and you can kind of see what's happening here is we plums are very prone to pest pressure so we're getting lots of pests on the plums which are causing them to fall not fully ripen from the tree so this will this will happen with any fruit tree uh, that you have but just know if that's you know like what you're going to plant in your yard just know that this will be a consequence uh, again, I personally don't find it to be an issue. You can mow right over them. Raccoons, everything comes, you know, it's fine. Something else will eat it. But the benefit is you get these beautiful, tiny little plums that are just so sweet. There aren't any that are ripe now to show you, but here's one that's ripening. You do see that it does have some pest pressure. Um, fruit trees in general take, especially non-native fruit trees in general, take a little bit more 
love, I'll say, as far as like uh, keeping disease at bay and keeping pests at bay. Um, so if, if you're not like, don't have the time to keep up with like a spray schedule in the fall or pruning, which we really don't do for this tree, at the very least, you'll get some fruit most years and you'll have a very lovely tree with a nice like um, spreading branch structure to, to plant other things around. So it's still a nice, uh, definitely a nice and worthwhile addition to your yard, even if you can't do the maintenance work to keep it fruiting, like pruning and spraying at very specific life stages. So let's go over here and talk about a vine real quick. So over here we have a pergola and then around the base of the pergola we planted young grapevines. So this is what a baby grape looks like. It's going to grow up this four by four post and will ultimately cover the top of the pergola, which will provide a natural like source of shade in a few years. Um, so grape vines are great for covering arbors and pathways, you know, arching structures and stuff like that and have nice like foliage and, you know, fruit clusters uh, later in the summertime. So if you have some somewhere for a, a edible vine to go, a grape would be a good option. There's some grapes that do better in Missouri humidity than other grapes, so just make sure that you choose one that's suited for our uh, climate. But Missouri does grow grapes well. All right, let's move on to raspberries and strawberries. So at the Veterans Urban Farm, we have a raspberry and strawberry patch that grows together, which is great. You get the strawberries from May to June, and then the raspberries um, the rest of the year. The raspberries we have are La Lathrop raspberries, and they kind of bear um, for a good several months during the season. So right now, the strawberries are finished producing. They're kind of lower on the ground, and then the raspberries grow this like kind of hedge around them. So those, we have found that those work really well together and just like getting a lot of fruit out of a small area. I would say that raspberries are maybe not the most attractive perennial like fruiting plant, but honestly, I don't care because I think the fruit totally makes it worthwhile. And like I said, this variety was producing from you know, from June to August last year, which is a great, a great um, thing to have in your backyard. Berries are pretty expensive in the grocery store, um, but if you have kind of like a little hedgerow growing somewhere in your yard, they're very easy to grow. Pretty aggressive, actually, and so your patch will grow over time. Um, so it's a great way to like have this really nice. Um, food source kind of in the peak of summer that's really expensive to get and maybe not as tasty at a grocery store. So another standard, let's go up this way, we're going to visit one of our elderberries. So elderberries are a native plant. They're a great hedge. They're a great landscaping plant in general because it's a really pretty plant. It's got beautiful flowers that the flowers are just turning into fruit right now so you don't really get to see them. Uh, so this is our elderberry. So this is the flower structure. There's no flowers anymore. They flower pretty profusely in May but you can kind of see how the flowers are structured and then on these branches there's a whole mass of white flowers. This one doesn't look like it got pollinated very well. I only see a few fruits on it. Let's see if there's a better example. Right here has more fruits and you can see how big this flower was. Huge. Um, so elderberries, super easy to grow. Beautiful uh, flowers for the pretty much the whole month of May. Um, they do produce these really nice little like dark purple berries in later summer. And these berries are very like good for your health. A lot of people make syrups and like um, like it, people make like cough syrup and stuff out of them. They're a little hard to harvest because you want to try to stay away from eating these little stems. So it's a little challenging to get just the berry, not the stems. Some people use forks to harvest them, to pop them off the stems. Some people just separate them by hand. Um, but 
really healthy, really, really easy to grow. In the winter time, all you do is pretty much cut down most of the plant, the older branches, or some people just cut the whole plant down to the ground and it just comes back every spring. Um, you can see this is about, there's kind of a tree growing in the way. It gets about 10 feet tall and this is kind of the, the you know, the spacing. So you can plant multiple as a living kind of like um, living fence around your property line that really fills out nicely, quickly every spring and summer. So we love, this is the only elderberry we have at this spot in the farm. We have a whole bunch on our southern property line that just kind of uh, define the boundary of our property. Um, and it's just a wonderful plant that insects love. The berries are really healthy for you. Easy to grow, native. It's a winner, in my opinion. Attractive. Um, let's hit the Jerusalem artichokes. So Jerusalem artichokes are another uh, native plant. They do not produce a fruit that we eat. We actually eat the tuber. Jerusalem artichokes are very aggressive though. So we have it, them growing right next to our driveway. And the idea is that they don't really spread south past the driveway because we're just continuously driving here. Uh, but they do, this is, this is their growth habit. This is like hundreds of plants. You can see they kind of look like sunflowers. They grow these um, little yellow, relatively little yellow flowers in like the fall. Uh, and they're pretty. Some years they're prettier than others. But they, they expand exponentially. Um, so you want to make sure to plant these in an area where you can keep them contained. Because they're going to expand by their roots. And it's actually the tubers, the, like the below ground structures of the plant that you eat. So in the fall, you can get your potato fork out. You can kind of dig up some of the plants as you're cutting them back and cleaning your garden for the fall. And you can eat them like potatoes. Um, they're kind of starchy, um, but they're good roasted or mashed or in soups and stuff. Um, and then you can save some of the tubers to grow more Jerusalem artichokes the following year. Uh, we planted these. These are about seven or eight years old, this patch. It started off as one row, and it just, you can see it just kind of grows every year. And then last but not least, you, I would be remiss to talk about uh, developing an edible landscape in your backyard if I didn't talk about herbs. So today we talked a lot about fruit trees, um, fruiting shrubs. We talked a little about Jerusalem artichokes, but so we've kind of gone in like descending height. Um, so herbs are a great thing to tuck in and around other plants, like taller plants, some kind of shady plants. So we have some really nice lavender, some beautiful thyme uh, I'd like to show you. So this is thyme. This is like an exceptionally happy uh, planting of thyme. And there's a little bumblebee. I don't know if you can see it, but it's visiting the little thyme flowers. There's some chives right here. So thyme is a nice herb that's pretty, um, pretty easy to grow. It, this is a, in a partly sunny location and it does splendidly. It's in a raised bed. So you could put herbs like thyme near your raspberries and strawberries or your Asian plums or anything that will provide some dappled shade and it will grow aggressively if it's in well-drained soil. So you can see it's got these nice flowers that are good for the pollinators right now. It's, you could, <laughs> there's so much thyme here that you could use for months and months and months. I mean, it would take so long to go through all this thyme. So it's a nice kind of, it, it's a nice kind of um, long-term planting that you can incorporate uh, in between like your perennial fruits and things like that. It's also really, um, it's something that you can like very fragrant, I guess you, I guess would be the word to use. Um, so it's herbs are really nice thing to include in your landscape because not only are they beautiful and they flower and they're perennial so you don't plant them as often they're also very fragrant which is like just brings this whole nother level of like um, I don't know enjoyment to your garden 
And then behind me, behind the thyme and the chives, is our lavender. Lavender is also really well known for its um, fragrance. It's also a beautifully like spreading herb like thyme. This is also in a raised bed, so it also likes the kind of drainage of a, that a raised bed offers. Good for pollinators with these flowers, long lived, fragrant. You can use it and, you know, you can dry it and put in your house. You can use it in a lot of different ways. Or you could just have it for like the sheer beauty of it, kind of next to some of your other perennial plantings. So when you're designing a food producing landscape, you usually want to start from the tallest plants. You want to think about what are the tallest plants that I want to plant around my yard and then kind of work smaller from there. Start with the big things and then lo locate where you want to put them and then go one level lower. So you, maybe you start with some larger trees like a couple mulberries and a couple like standard apples which get really tall like you know 20 feet tall. And then so then we have that like on your garden map then go one level lower, like maybe put in some shorter like shrubs, like elderberries in and around those where, where elderberries will thrive with enough sunlight. Then after you have that level, then you go one level lower and figure out, okay, where can I tuck some raspberries? Where can I tuck some even going lower? Where can I tuck some strawberries and herbs? And so as you kind of like work from height down, that's how you can design your food producing landscape in your backyard. Um, it's a years long, you know, process. So don't expect to like make a, make a map of where you want to plant everything and then do it all in one year and have it be bumping and productive right away. It's going to take some time, but that's, I think one of the beauties of it is it's a, it's a labor of love and the more time it takes, the more invested you become and the more you love it. And it's just becomes this nice kind of like, um, just like charming and relaxing place to spend your time that also provides you with food which is the best of everything if you have any questions about specific plants that you want to plant in your yard um, or where you know where certain things would grow well like what kind of soil conditions or you know sunlight requirements let us know if you have any questions we'd love to help you um, as always thanks for joining us today and I look forward to hearing about your own food producing landscapes at your yard. Take care. Bye.